for joining us for another Top Virtual Staffing Solutions Virtual Town Hall. And for tonight's guest, we have Teacher Romer here. He's all the way in the Philippines to discuss his experiences regarding COVID-19. And yes, he's fully aware that this is recorded and he will be sharing all of his experiences that he's comfortable sharing regarding this. So to briefly introduce Teacher Romer, He's a jack of all trades, master of some, I would say many, but he's humble. All right, he is an educator, director, photographer, theater performer, choir master, and entrepreneur wrapped into one funny looking guy. That's what he says. I don't know. I, he's, a, he's funny. How about that? All right. And yeah. God fearing as well. <laughs> and his definition of relaxation is looking at pictures of puppies in my spare time and his spare time and sleeping until lunchtime. So, so again, teacher Romer, welcome. So thank you. Thank you, Manuel, for welcoming me to this uh, virtual town hall. Um, hello to everyone. Um, I appreciate the invitation. Well, um, this is after the, the piano lesson. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. All right. Thanks. So, again, as you guys can see here, he is a recovered patient. And when he was tutoring Miko uh, a few months back, he had to share us the news that he got uh, he you, you got uh, positive uh, results for being a COVID-19 of having COVID-19. And then I'm glad you're back here. You're tutoring Miko again. And then I ask you with these virtual town hall sessions, I think it's, it's good to hear from perspectives from a patient who recovered. And at the same time, what it is from another country to have different perspectives as well regarding how things are in relation to being a COVID-19 patient. So thank you for sharing all of these rather private matters with us. No problem. All right, cool. So I, all right. But before we proceed, speaking of disclaimer, all right, so it's an implicit consent, consent here that this is just for informational and educational purposes only. So obviously, especially when it comes to COVID-19, you have to talk to your medical professionals for anything else. So this is just from, from one patient's perspective and nothing prescriptive. So, all right, we got the legalese out of the way. All right, teacher Omar, uh, what do you want to share regarding your whole experience? <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's, it really is a long, long story. Uh, and I hope that's, that this will be short, but um, perhaps I start with the context of the, the cast of characters that I'll be talking about here in, in this discussion or in this story. Um, given that I just recently watched the movie musical Hamilton on Disney+, Plus, so um, I, was, uh, I was inspired to just say who the characters are. So the characters in my story will be, well, for one, we have the president of, of the Philippines, that's President Rodrigo Duterte. He's been here in the, uh, he's been running the Philippines for the past four years already. Um, well, that's the, that's the only cast of, uh, part of my cast that uh, is not part of my family, okay? So the rest are part of my family. You have my mother. So my mother is around 63. She was born 1958, while my father was born at nine, uh, 1956. So Hopefully my mother... Okay. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Hopefully yeah, your sure. parents are fine that you are disclosing their ages. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Carry on. Sorry. Uh, yeah, they, they, wouldn't, uh, they, they won't know about this. But they do know that I'm in a meeting right now. But my mother is yeah, at that, that age. But she's, the important thing about my mom is that she's a physician. She's a public health doctor in the local health center near her house. So if, uh, if you were to ask the, her, her focus, it's really general practice um, and public health. Well, on the other hand, my father, is, my father works as a vice president for 
associate vice president for logistics in a lo- local logistics company. Um, yeah, why is it important you know later? And my sister, she's also a doctor. Um, she's a bit older than I am. Um, and her her field is more of psychiatry. Um, but she, of course, later on I'll talk about the schools of thought that my mom versus my sister have. Um, so she's she's a psychiatrist in training. So she's currently taking a residency in the National Center for Mental Health, uh, which had its own issues uh, during in my story later. Um, also, part of my cast is my cousin, um, who's who was an aircraft mechanic in training in the Nino Aquino International Airport here, um, and. Well, just for for comedic purposes, I have my two dogs here as well, her and Toki. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, let's start the context first. Um, for the Philippines, well, here for the Philippines, we knew of the COVID. Not doesn't really the pandemic yet back in January, but same as the entire world, we knew about it in the news that there was this virus in that came from Wuhan. Um, and but back in January, since the travel was still very relaxed during that time, um, people from Wuhan were able to go to the Philippines. And back in January, a month after the Wuhan virus hit, January in January that was the first time that the Philippines had its COVID patient. Um, so there were around, if I'm not mistaken, there were around three people, three to four people who got COVID. But the good thing there was that they were all from China. There wasn't any local transmission. So we were, the Philippines and my friends and my family, we weren't really alarmed. It was just like saying, oh, that virus, it's now here. Um, it was on the same level as how alien, say, for us, uh, um, Ebola is. Um, it's, it's that. It's very distant for us. And then knowing that, oh, there, there's COVID here, good to know. But still, as a teacher, I was, a te- I was still a teacher of marketing back then. So uh, I was just continuing going to school. It was still pretty relaxed. Um, when, did the, when did we start getting a sense of urgency or a sense of uh, uh, a sense of not necessarily panic i would say it's panic but a sense of saying oh oh wait we have to take start taking care of ourselves maybe that was towards the end of january um when from just one patient it became two and then it became three and then it stopped at around four so i clearly remember that towards february in school we had an event called the the uh, high school fair, wherein there are rides and, and food and food booths, etc. So um, there was a concert during that time. And for the concert, um, before you enter the concert grounds, it was just basically a field, uh, the, the organizers, well, basically my students, they, they had to take the temperature of the people going in. Um, and also, one of the rules was that no mask, no entry. But if I compare it to the to this time, but the no mask, no entry thing back in February, that was too relaxed because like people were, uh, whenever people were were talking, they they just hang their masks on their left or their or on their right ear, and then they just eat, etc. So. Um, and there wasn't any social distancing, even if, you know, uh, there was a positive patient already back in January. Um, so we were cautious, but not really that cautious yet by come February. Um, it was still relaxed. We, we could still eat in our favorite restaurants. You could still go around and do um, our, our business. Um, but 
there was a drastic change come mid-March wherein there was another case and then there was another and another and another. Um, the cases started building up to the point that I would think there were around 10 already total cases during that time. Um, that's when the government, that's when Rodrigo Duterte said, um, okay, let's start putting in he didn't want to use the word lockdown because he didn't want to show his his fist uh, to the people. I think the ter- the term that they used was community quarantine. That's what they used. Um, it, the the date was March fifteen. I remember the news. Um, he was reporting all these things aside from his usual ramblings. Uh, he 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 told us that oh uh, Metro Manila that was a Thursday. Uh, he told us that Metro Manila will start the community quarantine come 15th of March. Okay, so um, 15th of March then was, I think, Sunday. Um, therefore, people had ample time to go back to the other islands of the Philippines. So, say for example, I do have my students who comes from Cebu. It's, a, it's, it's in the Visayas. It's in a, another part of the Philippines. You have to take a plane. So there were people who went home from from Metro Manila to Cebu to Leyte to different parts of the Philippines um, because there weren't any travel restrictions yet um, until the fifteenth of March. I would know that since I'm a theater person and a Shakespeare person, fifteenth of March is an omen. Um, that's what's called the Ides of March and Julius Caesar, by the way. Uh, really? That's when, yeah, that's when Julius Caesar was killed. Um, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. In, so, in, the, uh, in the Senate uh, floor, right? Yeah, I, yeah, in the Senate floor of Rome. <laughs> so before yes. I digress, <laughs> it was just interesting because you know the we theater people we were joking around. Beware of the Ides of March because that's what the soothsayer or the, uh, the wise person would tell the people of Rome that. Oh, beware of the Ides of March because uh, Julius Caesar would have been killed during that time. But <laughs> I digress. Um, but it gives a sense of perspective as well of how we didn't really take it seriously. Um, but at the same time, there was there was there was the the panic almost started. I I would notice the the alcohol and the well for not I, I know for the US it's alcohol and tissue paper, but for here it's just alcohol. Um it would run out and the Department of Trade and Industry they would start saying, Oh, we'll uh, please limit the number of bottles that you'll buy. Um so I would go to I would go to the supermarket and notice that there weren't any alcohol anymore. Um and yeah, that that was that was me seeing. A, oh, this is something real, something that really that's happening. And come March 14, the day before the Ides of March, um, my father or my sister they'd go to the grocery and notice that people were starting to panic buy already. Um, shelves were starting to run out. Um, and come March 15. That was the Ides of March. That's when community quarantine started. What happened there was um, here in the Philippines, the response has been more of military rather than health. I do think because um, it comes from Duterte himself, uh, Iron Fist. Um, he he um, he he say, okay, um, let's put up checkpoints in different areas. Um, but there wasn't any really uh, clear clear divide as to what people should do. Um, but come March 16, there, there, there was a rule that um, the, the, it is so vague. The, what the Tete said was um, Anyone who needs to work, go ahead and work, but just be careful. Um, but that didn't 
that didn't show any uh, any good thing come 16th of March because I had to I still had to drive uh, my car and and bring my my sister to the hospital um, to work and what I do what I did notice during that time was that of course there were there were military and police um, around the country uh, around around Metro Manila then but they were that strict. I saw a lot of people still on the streets. Given that it, it it was it was a it was a it was an eerie day for me because I knew that hey the virus is here already and there were a lot of people um, uh, hailing for a bus on the street. Um, there were people on the road. It's as if it was still normal. Um, you could see people wearing masks, but not all of them. Um, Duterte already said to, to practice social distancing. The, the health secretary all, also told us that. But still, the, the people weren't really obeying. That's when a more drastic approach was formulated come Monday night. Um, they, they told the country, the, the government told the country that we will have what is called an enhanced community quarantine. So the joke was already, oh, what what other adjectives can you add to quarantine? Okay. Um, there's already enhanced community quarantine. So um, so what happened there was it became more militarized. Um, only essential travel, no more no more commute, no more bus, no more jeepneys, no more um, trains. Um, the only way that you can travel from, say, for, from my town, which is Fairview, to another location in the, the in Metro Manila, is if you're if you prove that the person that you're with is a doctor or or a, an essential work, an essential worker. So that's the reason why I was able to witness myself uh, a change. Uh, the traffic. Compared to Monday and then Tuesday of the more of the stricter uh, quarantine protocols, I noticed that. Um, so the public, the, the public transportation yeah, was shut down. Yeah, it was shut but down, not, but not private yet. Not yet private. Okay. But but the police would stop you if they would notice that you um, if if oh, there there were checkpoints. So, so of course the police would stop you and then ask. Why are you driving and all? Oh, okay. So, so that's um, well. I was driving because I was I was bringing my sister to the hospital. That's that was an essential um, travel for me. Um, so, I noticed that people weren't on the streets anymore. There were still some few buses, but the the thing that I would really remember about it was I was a uh, I was. If, if the U.S. has what you call that Highway 60-something, um, we have EDSA here. That's Epifania de los Santos Avenue. And that's the 54-kilometer road uh, here in Metro Manila that bypasses all the cities here. Um, the, what happened was, I, as I was driving towards uh, the Green Hills area, I noticed a lot of taxi drivers and ta taxis, taxi cabs, they were parked. So they, there was a checkpoint first and then there was a, there was a multitude, sorry for being biblical, there was a multitude of, of, of taxi, uh, taxi cabs just stuck along EDSA. I do have a picture, but I, I, I forgot to just include it here. Um, yeah, that was really striking that it, it it, that that experience told me, oh, oh, shucks! This this thing, it's it's really real. Uh, it's being very very militarized, and they are really serious about it. That's why I took a picture of it back then. Um, so, uh, moving forward, I was the driver of my sister. Um, I'd pick her up, I'd fetch her, and go back. Uh, to the house, and here, here at home, we would start having more strict measures. We'd take a bath, and we, uh, the moment we get home, um, 
it, we 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 deem your house as the as the safe space. Um, moving on, um, things started to get personal when after March 16, around March 17, 18, around three three to four days after the declaration, um, my father received a call. So again, my, my father works in the logistics industry. So my father received a call from an office mate. He said that the office mate told my father that, um, hey, just be calm. Uh, in the phone call, hey, just be calm and uh, I have some news to tell you. One person who visited our office turned out to be positive. Okay. So my father was scared. Because he was in the office that day too. 15 minutes after the, the person left. But they were able to, to talk, but with a distance. Okay. Uh, but uh, that time we were really scared as in my sister didn't know yet. I, I was the one who fetched her again and that's when I told her, oh, my father was, uh, our father was exposed to, to a COVID positive patient. That's when you were really scared. I was dry, I, I was perspiring as I was driving to the National Center of Mental Health and thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with the last two weeks of my life? <laughs> like that already. Um, I was scared. And we went home, and then that's when the debate in the family started. Wherein should we report it to the authorities? And we had the moral obligation to do so. But um, given that my parents, my, my mom and the sister are doctors, we we were kind of confident that they were they could manage it. Given that we didn't want to risk my father being admitted to a hospital with a very relaxed. Uh, relaxed protocols um, well as compared to now um, we were really scared but we I believe that we we are on the safe we, we went to the safer option of it was a riskier option but I think it was the most calculated option of uh, sending my dad to the hospital and that's when I noticed difference, the difference in the hospital already. That's when I got to see that there was a triage area um, and there were tents outside of the hospital in our house. Um, we would wear masks already. And that's when I, that's the first time I saw people in the hazmat or the PPEs, uh, PPE suits. Um, why did we send my our father to the hospital? Even if my father wasn't that exposed as compared to the, to his office mates, well, because he was starting to show coughing symptoms during that time. Um, but eventually, we had to wait two days to get the results, and he didn't get swab test during that time because there was a lack of. There was a lack of swab, na swab tests nationwide during that time. Um, he, the, the order of the friend of my sister, who's an who's a epidemiologist expert, um, was to just get a chest x-ray and a complete blood check. So the CBC and the complete blood check. And then the friend of my sister, who's also a doctor, would check if, if, if the vital signs uh, were were showing of COVID nineteen. If it were showing of COVID nineteen, uh, my dad would get the swab test. But thank God that my father didn't really manifest more symptoms. But the moment that we knew that my father was exposed to COVID nineteen, um, that's when our fourteen day lockdown at home started. We didn't. We did not leave the house for the next fourteen days. It was a big adjustment, uh, but what comforted me was uh, a podcast, apparently by by Dr. Lori Santos. She's a she's a happiness expert, and in the podcast, it it was told that um, it was told there that you may be experiencing tough times during this moment, 
but do know that other people in the entire world are also facing isolation. They're also facing, they're also locking up their homes. So by the mere fact, she tells, by the mere fact that you know of these things, you won't feel less, you, you, you'll feel less lonely and more connected to the world, which, I, which really helped me um, psych up myself. Um, and which eventually helped me prepare for the COVID-19 experience that I had. Um, oh my gosh, this is a really long story, but you know. No, you're fine. Um, this is great because you're, you're sharing from a national perspective to, to how you were experiencing with all of that. It's yeah, all good. yeah. Go ahead, carry on. Okay, okay. So, um, so, my, so here at home, it was a complete lockdown. My, the only one buying our supplies was the health worker of my mom who had a tricycle, had, had, a, had a motorcycle. Um, and the only, the only reason that, my, that, that the health worker of my mom could travel to and from his house and then buy stuff was because he was a health worker himself. So, um, but in terms of the local the local unit our town which is called barangay here in the philippines um the local barangay they didn't really know of uh, the situation here at home but since my mom works for at the department of health her colleagues knew but not the local mm -hmm. the, our local area uh it was more of we didn't want to cause any panic because my parents knew how to yeah my parents yeah my parents knew how to manage it given that they'd always read about the virus so that yeah that's 15 days around we we finished 15 days without manifesting any symptoms there was although there was one moment where i wherein i experienced a cough i was panicking so i told my mom ma i really need to go to the hospital and 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 have myself checked so my mom allowed and i got myself checked uh my vitals and then i was interviewed by people I told them that I was uh, I was exposed to my father who was exposed um, to a COVID patient, um, but I thank God that I didn't really experience symptoms after that. Um, so we were clear for the until April. Okay, so in terms of the country, um, it was still in under the enhanced community quarantine, or you'd call it the ECQ. Cases would still rise. There were around increases of 30 patients per day during that time. Um, relative to February, it was alarming. 30 patients relative to February, that was alarming. Um, but what happened was... We were really thankful that, oh, finally, after 15 days, we could at least go out and buy stuff and my, my, my mom and my sister could finally work. Um, but my mom, she chose not to work because she's more than 60. Um, so she used her leave credits for that. While my sister, she started working because, you know, uh, she's, she's younger and and she's a resident so yeah yeah so so she had to work so i had to be the driver still um i think that went on me me as a driver and my sister working that went on from around april 1 to april 3 to 4. um what happened then was oh wait before april 1 around march 30 before my sister worked in the National National Center for Mental Health, that was March 30, she had to get clearance from the authorities of the hospital work. Um, yeah. Because the hospital already knew that my sister was exposed to the virus. Yeah. And I think it's ba ba basic protocol to, to, to have yourself checked up before you actually work. So... So I was with my sister, and my sister was wearing a mask, but the a more loose mask. She was wearing a face shield, um, and she was going around the entire campus of the hospital because it's a 
that that hospital is a really really big hospital with with many hectares of land. Um, I was driving her around, and she was talking to her co-residents, um, but with a mask. The thing about that was um, we were relaxed, uh, but we didn't use alcohol. When when we were inside the car, I would spray myself when my sister would go in, and then I'd spray my sister when she'd go in. Um, yeah, it, it, it was the obsessive-compulsive uh, mode with us during that time. You, um, so it was until April 1, 2, and 3. But my sister, she got the directive from the National Center for Mental Health that they'd start another kind of duty wherein um, they'd stay in the hospital for two weeks um, one week to 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 practice to actually do duty, while for the next week to stay in, next two weeks rather to stay in quarantine. Um, you know, so I was starting to see on a national level directives, and then it being applied here in the family with, with my sister. Um, therefore, my sister back up her things and for the next two days that was uh, April um, uh, April 3, 4 over the weekend my sister didn't live with us she she spent her days in the hospital working there um, I didn't miss my sister it was actually very relaxing uh, to have an <laughs> anyway just kidding aside um, come April 5 that's when we got the news after praying the rosary. That's when we got the news from my sister. She, she called my mom. She called me and then said, Oh, Romar, you remember, you remember March 30? Yeah. We were going around the, the hospital. Um, and then I said, Yeah, why? Apparently, the, one of the people I talked to there was COVID positive. Um... She only knew that she was COVID positive two days after, or two to three days after. And then he said, what? Um, that April 6th was the birthday of my mom. Um, and and that's, that's, I think that was a Monday. And that's when we received the news. Um, and my mom, my dad, and my cousin, we met. Hey, what are we gonna do about this? Um, so we decided, and the hospital decided that um, my sister should be sent home um, to not continue her duty, so as not to infect the patients there, because um, it was really a isolated area. But on the other hand. When when we took her when, when I took my sister home already, that's when the news began um, on over Twitter that there was this journalist named Atom Araulio. He he tweeted that there is a there is a weird case in the National Center for Mental Health of 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 seventy five health workers turning positive. Yeah, 75. Um, that's when we were alarmed. And we were scared because my sister was exposed. Yeah. Um, so what we did at home was when, when my sister arrived, before, before we picked up our sister, um, I'll show you an example. This is a cabinet. This is, this is a closet in my, in my room. Okay. Imagine it's that tall. It's that tall. Uh-huh. Um, we placed this her cabinet, this cabinet, um, uh, in an area to block her entrance from us. So she would have her own CR or her own her, uh, her own washroom and or and shower and her own room, and that's the divide basically. Okay. So I take her home, and when we when she arrived, we pushed entire cabinet and then 
essentially block her for the next two months. <laughs> so you lock her able... in. <laughs> yeah, lock her in. Lock her in. Um, okay. So for the next four days, from April 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, um, we would uh, we would send her it is in the house already. Mm-hmm. We would send her food um, by placing by giving her utensils in her own room and placing and placing a a, a tray above the cabinet and a chair so that I could I could uh, go up the chair and then place her food there and then she would transfer the food to her plate and then the empty plate would be there on top and then we would wash it with hot water with alcohol um so we were really careful at home already and then um my mom so this is where this is where my topic on the different schools of thought would come in my mom being an older doctor um she would watch some facebook videos of with millions of views of people telling that oh the virus is uh, the the virus is susceptible to heat um and etc so she would tell us that oh you should have what is called the steam inhalation inhalation so she would boil water um and then when the steam would come out she'd put salt and then we would inhale that uh me, pra- uh, I, I practice critical thinking, so I don't always I, I I take it with a grain of salt. Sorry for the pun, um, but I take it with a grain of salt. Whatever my mom tells me, especially if it seems like a hocus pocus or some traditional medicine and stuff like that. So I would look at articles online, and they would say that the virus doesn't really go away with steam. Yeah. Um, so, I would tell mom na, uh, that mom look at the new, look at articles online um, and reliable articles online and not just Facebook video. And then she would tell me, no, okay, um, I am six plus years old. So no matter no matter how absurd some treatments I may have. I know my I know stuff because for one I am a doctor, and two, um, aside from her being a doctor, um, let's let's practice it with utmost caution. Um, let's be really really cautious. So whatever whatever, I think she was that desperate during that time, um, and panicking during that time because she told us whatever ray of light she would see in terms of medication, she would mm-hmm. adhere to that. Okay. Um, so that was her perspective. Well, on the other hand, I had this perspective. Luckily, my sister also had my perspective that these things don't work. But given that Filipino culture, even uh, we here in the Philippines, we don't leave until we get married and things like that. Um, what happened was uh, we had to follow the directives of my mom. Uh, he would inhale steam three times a day. That was really dreadful. Um, For how long? That, uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Yeah, 15 minutes. It was a really boring time. Um, glad thing I I still listen to the podcast of Lori Santos, and then she uh, she would tell uh, this is a tip for everyone. Uh, by the way, she he would tell that if you find something really really boring, and then do and then just do something while you're doing that. Do something that interests you. It's called in, in I think in psychology. You correct me if I'm wrong. You're the psych person here. Um. I think it's called uh, combi- uh, I, it's, it escapes my mind but it's combining 
combining combining what you love doing. <laughs> it is a scientific Define. term for it. So basically, okay. yeah. trying to as you yeah. go through that process, you are engaging with something else. If you could, yeah. Okay. So, so okay. yeah, um, I I was watching memes and videos of people, or I was watching the news, which interests me. Uh, while I was doing the steam inhalation, so that was fifteen puppies, minutes. Right? It was easy. And then puppies, yeah. I was watching. I was taking care of my puppy, uh, my my <laughs> dogs. Uh, the puppies ca came later. I I think after my COVID already. Um, oh, okay, gotcha. But 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 um, what did help was the company of dogs. Really, mm. they, they they do help. Um, yes. Eventually, April ten came. And then that was Good Friday, um, Friday before Easter. Yeah. Um, there was my my sister before going home. She got herself swabbed. Um, and come April ten, that's when I knew I was already starting with Miko with teaching piano with Miko. Um, that's when the news came that my sister turned out to be positive, COVID positive. Uh. And we were panicking. We started to panic, but we did. We were more careful from there. Um, my realizations during that time was shocks. Um, from from January, when I told myself that oh, it's already uh, it's already hit home here it's in, here in the Philippines, I would. And then when I, when when the exposure when there was a, an exposure from my father, I told myself oh, it really really hit close to home already. It's my father is a person under investigation. I wouldn't think that it would really hit that close to home that my sister would be positive. So it was difficult to wrap that thought in my head. Uh -huh. um, I had to live with it, um, and we were we were cautious. That's when that's I I think you would agree. Uh, to seeing this, that there was this one piano lesson when you were surprised that I had the mask on, even if I had, if I was inside my room, and that's when you knew that my sister turned out to be positive. Yeah. Um. So that was. Yeah, because I asked. I mean, you're at home. Why? You know. What, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was when the news happened. Um. Mm -hmm. So we would, from April five onwards. It was once again a lockdown. We would, I would joke with my my cousin. Here we go again. Uh, another fifteen days. Another fifteen days. Yeah, that's right. Another yeah, fifteen guess, days. Yeah. And a uh, more serious fifteen days. Mm. Um. That then he started to panic at home. What would we do? We put masks on. We, um, really blocked ourselves from the outside world. Even if I were just. Um, watering my plants outside, I'd wear a mask outside. Um, and then, um, going back to the situation of the country, due to the lack of swab tests, the and yeah, there was the 15 days, but the 15 days passed. What's April 5? If my sister, we knew that our sister was exposed. 30 because of, of her clearance so counting counting from her exposure it should have been that by April 14 um, a swab test for my sister should have been available but no um, due to the lack of swab tests in the country it wasn't what was the case number uh, what was the in increment of the case numbers increasing during that time, it was around to 60s already, around 60s to 70s per day. Uh -huh. um, but there was a lack of testing. Um, people on Twitter were calling out that um, in Tagalog, it's it's deemed um, uh, military. Well, militarization, hospitalization, or para in, in English, um, no, not to militarize, don't militarize the issue. Mm -hmm. um, focus on the health. Because, because um, Duterte had 
every Monday he would declare stuff because he was uh, he was already um, informed by the Congress. There was a law passed. It's called the Bayanihan Heal as One Act. It it put in more strict measures for the quarantine. It put in directives on what should be closed, what businesses should be closed. So um, it was purely it was purely essential businesses. Um, there was a liquor ban, and people were affected. I was I was affected by that as well. Um, and liquor ban. So you you were not allowed to drink, uh, buy buy liquor anymore, um, and etc. Um, so there there was militarization, and there was the hashtag mass testing, please. Um, but the the government was focused on other things during that time. Um, so there, um, that that national issue it also affected this house. How my sister did not have testing. Um, it wasn't part of the community testing. And then eventually, what happened was come April twenty two. Um, the there was an ambulance that came to our house. And come April 22, the DOH, the Department of Health, already knew that I was uh, that, that my sister was positive. But um, well, the moment that they came in, we were really scared because we were scared of people looking at our house because some people with hazmat suits would go in. Yeah. Uh, would go in the house. Is that serious? Uh, okay. Yeah. So so to take a swab test from my sister. Mm. So. Um, that was the first time that my sister uh, was able to meet another person in the flesh again. I got out uh, of the cabinet. <laughs> not get get out of the cabinet, but yeah, I mean, a person cabinet, went in. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Oh okay. So, gotcha, gotcha. so a person oh. in a hazmat suit went in. Uh, I have huh. a picture of that, but it's on my Instagram. Um, <laughs> I was documenting because. Part of history, you know. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I was actually joking around with my sister that this was a joke, actually. And I and looking back, this was a really bad joke on my my part. I was joking around. Oh, I also want to be part of history. Uh, I hope that someday I could all get the virus and get a get a number as well and and say, oh, someday uh, I would tell my son or my daughter that oh, I was able to outlive the. I don't know. It's also part of the. Speaking up myself, um, it helped me have a temporary escape and to look forward um, that someday I would tell my own story of what happened in the same way that, oh, um, can I just, my battery is running. Oh, your battery is running. My, my battery is running out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was mine. Yeah, but uh, I'm juiced up right now. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, so where was I? Uh, where was I again? Yeah, sorry. So, 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 so they, they went in. Not so, so they went, went inside. And the priority there was for my sister to get tested. But since my parents are both senior citizens, beyond 60 already, mm -hmm. they had to have... Uh, themselves swamped as well. But given that me and my cousin were exposed to my sister as well, we had ourselves swamped as well. But the directive was, it was supposed to be really my parents and my sister. Um, so I experienced swab test. Now this is a completely different story. What is the experience of a swab test? Um, I don't know if it's the same with you guys there in the U.S., but for us, um, for doing the swab test, it was it was convenient because it was at home, um, but it was a hassle because people would look. There was an ambulance yeah, outside right. the house, um, so the experience of a swab test was um, they put a very very long Q-tip. Um, I don't know if it's the same there, and then I thought it was just really like um, some. You, you, it, it was it was that it was as if you were cleaning your ear with a Q-tip, but no, it was 
it was way deep. I didn't know that my, my nostrils would be that deep. Was it painful? Um, it was, I'm weird. I found it exciting because I'm already part of history. I, I, I was experiencing history right in front of my fingertips. So, um, so um, I experienced swab test. I thought it was over when, when they put a swab on my left nose. No, they also had to put a swab on my right nose. I thought it was over. They also had to put a swab uh, on my tonsils. So that was a new experience. It was a weird experience at the same time. That's why I took pictures of it as well. Um, what was the effect of the swab? April 22. If I remember it correctly, April 22. I felt a sense of itchiness in my throat. I couldn't determine if it was because of a virus or... Yeah, there was sense, a sense of itchiness already. Yeah. Um, the protocol then for my sister was that you had to have two negative tests before declaring that you're cleared of the virus. Um, it's way different from now, uh, wherein you'll just need one. Okay. So there's, there's the, there are two schools of thought that I had to play when I myself was a recovering patient back in, COVID, um, back in May. But going back to April, um, April 22, swab test, and then we had to wait um, April 10, eight days before we got the before we got the results um going back to the context of the philippines i would have students who told me that, um sir my father was coughing then when my father was coughing we sent him to a private hospital um it's more for the richer guys um a private hospital here in the philippines and I was really surprised that the moment that my my student's father was swabbed around three to four hours after he got his results, mm-hmm. as compared to us normal people, uh, we get our results eight days after. That was a that shows the gap of of the rich and the poor. It really COVID nineteen. Uh, COVID nineteen didn't uh, didn't just bring a virus. It exposed broken systems in the government and the culture, um, and and to push it even further. People were really mad around April because there was this one senator who 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 went to a hospital here in the Philippines. Um, and did not go through the triage area and induced his connections because his wife was giving birth. Mm-hmm. Turns out two days after, oh, um, turns out that a few days before that, they were all, they were tested. But the results came out a day only after when the wife of that senator gave birth. Oh. That the senator was positive. Wow, it turned out that it the came name in positive. basically as yeah. being positive. Okay. Yeah, and that was a huge uh, issue here in the country. Um, there, you there were great demands for mass testing, but you have here senators who had what was called VIP testing. Uh, even if they had minimal symptoms, they would go and have themselves tested, and I think that explains the reason of the backlog of backlog of the normal people um you have these politicians who deem themselves as gods as julius caesars of the ides of march saying that oh they they need to get tested because they they were serving the public well in fact the health the health workers the policemen the nurses they didn't get tested they only got tested if they had symptoms. So on the other hand, you had these politicians who were being tested even if they had like, oh my gosh, I have a cough, let's let me get tested. So I think that explains the context of the of the backlog. Um, that's why I, when I was waiting, I wasn't really, when, when we got swabbed, I wasn't expecting that, oh, then come the next day, I, I'd have the results already. 
So from April 22 to April 30, while I was waiting, it was normal for us. Whatever we practiced from April 1 to April 22, that's what we practiced here at home. April 30. April 30, we got the results. Um, I was that was I was still teaching Nico back then, and I was already studying for the GMAT because I wanted to uh, study for a business school. Um, there, um, after again praying the rosary, I don't know what's up with the rosary. Does it reveal God's God's uh, love or what? Um, that's when we got the news that um, who were positive in our house. We are five in our house. That's my mom, dad, sister, uh, me, and my cousin. The news was that my father tested out negative while my while I was negative, uh, while I turned out to be positive. And my sister, thankfully, turned out to be negative. But again, context of my sister, you need to have two negatives before you're yeah. cleared. Okay? On the other hand, the two remaining members of the family, they still didn't have results. Okay. Okay. So, you could only imagine the stress that we had to go through given that uh, news outside and then finally my realization was that uh, shocks, January, my realization was it's hitting home. March, my father, it's hitting home. And then my, my sister, April, it's hitting home. And then finally May, it hit me. That was unima unimaginable. Um, I was trying to put in my sense of humor back then, and then well, well, I received the news. I was said, "Yes, I'm part of history finally." But still, deep inside, there was a sense of loneliness on my, in on my end. Okay. Yeah. I, I and and thank God that you and Nico were also part of this story of me being able to share because without. Without you helping me process, I wouldn't have uh, had the more stable mindset during that time as well. Um, me teaching Nico, thankfully, kept me sane during April. Uh, yeah, that, that's why that that moment when I found your name, you found my name in, I know that's that's a miracle. That's a miracle in itself. Um, teaching Nico piano while experienced all these at home help me keep myself sane so for the people out uh people out there who who are experiencing covid or or loneliness find something meaningful to do find something that you love doing and then do that um because i had to stop i had to stop living my normal life uh, of going to school and teaching of meeting my girlfriend of uh, Drinking with friends, of, of, of you know, just going out and living my own life, uh, and 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 I had my bit, my own small business. I make empanadas, they're small pastries. It was a thriving business. It it helped me keep afloat. But I had to stop that because I knew that if I continue with my empanada business, I would pose a risk to those who would buy because my parents and my sister are frontliners. Um, so I, I had the decision. It was a heartbreaking decision to say, "Oh, I stop this indefinitely." I don't know when I when I should begin it again, but I have to stop it indefinitely. So going back, that was my realization. Come eight thirty, that I received the news that it hit home. It hit me. Um, it had it still didn't sink in. I think it just sunk in twelve days or eighteen days after I got the virus that. Oh, shucks, this is really, really serious. Um, I think I was, of course, you know this. The, I, I was experiencing the the five stages: the denial, anger, yeah. the dabda. Okay, the denial, awesome. anger. Yeah. yeah, I was experiencing. I, I was experiencing the denial. Um, I, I I was also experiencing anger. It was really a mix of emotions during that time. And come April, uh, when when we received the news. The entire family had to sit down once again, um, and there, uh, sit down meaning 
um, my my father and my since they knew that I was positive already, I was locked in my room. Yeah. Okay. So it was my father, my my mother, and my my cousin outside there. Um. So I was I was I was talking through my phone, and my sister was also talking through the phone, and then we had come into terms that it would be difficult to have two COVID positive patients at home. Um, we have a lack of cabinets <laughs> to, to block the doors. Right? Uh, we would run out of cabinets. So there was a decision since, since my mom knew, since my mom worked for the government and the Department of Health of the, of the city, she knew that for COVID positive patients under investigation and patient, positive patients, if you experience mild symptoms, you don't have to go to the hospital and you know be there because if you're in the hospital, you're posing a you're you're, you're facing yourself with big risk. Yes. Um. There, there's a COVID facility. It's basically a hotel. Okay. Um. So that's they they call it Hope One facility, and then there's a Hope Two facility. Wherein the person under investigate under investigation would uh, be placed. Um, my mom was concerned because, of course, being the parent, she would have my well-being in mind. Um, because she knew, and I also knew, that there were COVID facilities here in the country. Again, you're, you're here in the national perspective, the macro perspective. Again, um, there were COVID facilities that were just classrooms. And there were just dividers, uh, there were just dividers placed, but they were open air. And I think that that's good, but still, classrooms here in the Philippines, they're, they're really crammed, they're really, they're used as evacuation centers when, when there are typhoons here in the country. So my mom was concerned that, oh, let me first check if you will be sent to hope one versus hope two. Um, so it's not really her using her powers as I know, but rather she was just checking if it's hope one. Hope two. Good thing that I was assigned to hope one and it was the hotel. Um, was it a good hotel? It was a good hotel. Um, not five star, of course. I would thank the Lord if it was a five star hotel with pool access and all. But you know, I'd, I'd be thankful for what you what you're given. It was a basic hotel, almost a studio type room, without a kitchen, without a refrigerator. Um, I was sent there. So when I knew that I was positive, I was first sent to the hospital. So I was there in the hospital to have my vitals checked, meaning my x-ray and complete blood check. But I was separated from the normal people. So people were actually looking at me already. Um, and and after that, I was sent. I was sent to the hotel, uh, and then that hotel, to give you a context, is of course its hotels are non-essential business. So they do have to find new business right now. So the business that they have is they rent out the entire hotel to the Quezon City government, and I don't know. I don't know the arrangements from there, but I think one of the arrangements is that. You're not supposed to divulge the name of the hotel, so let's rename the hotel into Hope One facility. I think that explains why it's called Hope One. Um, so, in the hotel or in the facility, you have uh, for the entire building five floors, and then for the entire five floors, you have one doctor and six nurses, uh, or seven nurses, and then police. And then the chefs and the the cooks. How did I know about this? Because um, I didn't meet them. I only met the doctor upon my arrival. So and then after that, it was all through phone calls because I w I wasn't even given a key card uh, to go out of the room. Of course. Um, so I was inside that room for twenty five days. So from Wow, okay. 25 days. Um, but on the 1st of May, 
I I got myself swabbed again. And when I was swabbed, I had to wait 13 days before finally reali uh, finally getting the results that I was negative. So if I were to to analyze the days of me being positive, it means that the days that I were positive were the days that I was at home. That the you days were that I was positive teaching, back then. Yep. Yeah, the days that I was teaching me piano, I was already yeah. positive during that time. Um, but, you know, protocol again, with a school of thought, April 13, I'm uh, sorry, May 13, I got the negative result. So, but my mom, knowing that, uh, told me that, oh, let's wait for the negative, another negative, to confirm. Yes. Okay. But there was uh, already a new, a new directive from the Department of Health that a negative, only one negative, you're okay to go. But um, we were really playing it safe because um, given that, you know, for comorbidities of my parents, Yes. We had to. I had to wait. Uh, I at least, at least, the doctor in the hospital. They were open to the option that um, that I could extend my stay. And some of you would ask, was it free of charge? Yes, the government paid for it. Um, what was the day like during my stay there? It was. It was lonely. It was lonely. Um, good thing it's air conditioned. Mm -hmm. Good thing there was Wi Fi. Um, and there was, there. I had my own. It was, I was experiencing, I don't know if you're familiar with this, the Catholic guys there. Um, it's a retreat. Uh, yeah. you'd, you'd go on your own. It's like the nation 30 day retreat for me. Yeah. Um, only that I experienced it for 25 days. So, what kept me sane during that time was some um, conference calls, my family. Um, I think if if you get if if people get coronavirus, yeah. what really helped me was sharing it with people I know would care. I shared it with my friends. I shared it with you guys. I shared it with 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 my colleagues, and not only. Was there prayers, uh, but there was support that there's the assurance of people messaging me that hey, um, if you need someone to talk to, you just message me. Yeah. Um, that really helped. Um, there were also times when when people would send me because deliveries were allowed. People mm -hmm. would send me my favorite food. Um, so what was the food? Um, the regular food was, uh, they would give us food, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, mm -hmm. Fruits, and with side dishes, actually. <laughs> so, so, and with so you, were, you were spoiled for 25 days. <laughs> yeah, actually. Um, people were, eh, well, the, it's like when people knew that I was negative, they, they'd be really concerned. Oh, Romar, we'd pray for you, pray for you. But when I would tell about my situation that, and I'd show them, I'd show them my room. Mm -hmm. They'd tell, oh, that's a hotel. You're actually doing a staycation. Yeah. Then I said, well, it's a lonely hotel because you'd have to stay here for... At first, I was really excited though. Oh, wow, this is the life, you know? Uh, experiencing no symptoms. It's because I was negative, actually, during that time. I during that time no already. Symptoms. I'd play games on my... And, um, I'd study the GMAT because yeah, yeah. I had a pending GMAT come May 31. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I was studying, I was downloading, um, downloading exams and all. So I had a routine, like wake up at 9 a.m. and then exercise for an hour and then, and then come 12 o'clock, um, eat and then wash dishes take a bath, and then, um, well, one technique was that if you go to a COVID facility, don't bring a lot of things. Bring two sets, three sets of clothes. Yeah. One for going out, and then two for for the home. So, for staying home. So, that that's a hard thing that I learned because I, I, 
I, I brought a whole, whole suitcase of clothes during that time. So on my first week, I had a lot of things to, to wash. But eventually, I knew, oh, okay. Uh, let, let me just be a Boy Scout and, and be resourceful. I, can, I found out that clothes can dry if you just hang them up for a day. So, <laughs> so, so that was, was mind-boggling for me. Even at this point, um, you would notice in, 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 our, in, our, um, in our meetings that sometimes I wear the same thing because I still bring that skill that I learned of washing in the clothes every day. Mm-hmm. It's me sane. These simple things, it kept me sane. Um, yes. So 25 days. Um, perhaps I would look at those 25 days as a spiritual turning point of my life as well. Mm-hmm. Um, fifth, four, I think 15 days. It was spiritually dry, meaning... Um, in terms of asking God and things like that, I would doubt. But what's this? Uh, I believe in you, God, but am I experiencing this? Um, I think that God has left me and things like that. Um, but even in the darkest of situations, God can still find a way to, to at least enter your life, even if you think that He's forgotten you. Um, what helped me was... I was scrolling through Facebook and then I have this one Jesuit priest who just posted a picture of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Uh, for those of you who don't know, St. Ignatius of Loyola is the founder of the Jesuits. He founded the spiritual exercises. And then seeing that picture, um, there was a gush of emotions that came to me and said, shocks, St. Ignatius of Loyola himself experienced what I experienced, although it was a different time and period, he experienced, he, 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 for, his, for context, he had a cannonball injury um, and for the next three to four months could not find any, anything that was very meaningful. He tried to search for things that could please him. Um, in our context, it would be he wanted Netflix but did not have internet connection. Um, he wanted romance novels but did not have inter- internet connection or did not have books during that time. Um, he wanted things of the world. So what really also kept me sane was I read the autobiography of St. Ignatius of Loyola. But just the, that part wherein he was alone. And it helped me. It re- miraculously, it helped me get a perspective and an understanding that one, I am not alone, and two, God did not leave me during that time. And and three, that even if you think you are spiritually dry, God can still work. Um, that was a movement Godwards. That was a consolation. Even if I felt sad, there was a certain sense of East underlying in me that um, in Tagalog it's ipasa Dios um, in English trusting the Lord um, that no matter what happens whether I it came to that point huh, that whether I die whether I pass the MBA test um, whether I turn out negative whatever happens to my life because of that trust in the Lord. Uh, which my spiritual director would also, because I would call him when I was there, um, and I got confession over the phone. Uh, validi- the validity of that, let's talk about in, an, in a theological discussion next time. But um, because, of the, because of those realizations, it really helped me understand that I, I wasn't alone. And I think that's important. That's an important message to people who are experiencing COVID-19 or for the people who... That you are never alone, even if you're just one person in the room, or even if you're if you guys are just two there, and etc. Um, there, there, there was grace all around. Um, so, so um, the last three days of my COVID experience there in the hotel really helped me because it helped me establish a sense of spirituality, 
So it, it helps. Um, it helped me attend mass every 6 p.m., albeit online. Um, and it helped me establish a routine and trust that no matter what happens in my life, it will be okay. It's going to be fine. The good thing is you're alive at this very moment. The good thing is that you are here. So it was a big realization for me. I was so scared of what would happen in the future. What would my job be? What would my, if I don't pass this MBA, what would happen? If I don't get a scholarship, what would happen? No, because of this trust, I was fully present. I was, and I think that's one thing that you have to learn, gratitude. Gratitude of the here and now. If there was that one lesson that I could give to people, it's gratitude. Um, and I was come May 25. That was, I, I was almost insane. Um, that 25th day, I was doing music. I was, uh, that's, a, that's a day when I received that. Oh, you got the, I got the call that I was tested negative already. Okay. So finally, I could be able to go home. Um, I'm sorry, uh, my, something that also I skipped was come May 1, my, my cousin also tested positive. Yeah, because so, he's part of the character. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 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 part of the character. So there were two of us in uh, the family inside. So did they so, stay in the hotel too? or? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh, okay. Stayed in the hotel. But we were in a separate room, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, <laughs> let me just tell you a funny thing that happened in the hotel. Okay. Um, I would order food from Burger King. Sorry, I, I, I same brands here. I, I ordered food from Burger King and then I, I dialed in, okay? My room is room number 507, okay? The delivery in the hotel, they can only just bring up the food come 3 o'clock to 6 o'clock p.m. So I ordered it around 10 a.m. So the food came at around 12 noon, but they were only able to bring it up to the room at around 6 or 5 o'clock. So the, bur the two burgers that I ordered were already cold by mm. that time. Okay. So why is this a story? Because it's really interesting. Um, I ordered the food. The, the delivery guy told me, oh, I left the food at the table at the dining at the lobby already. Okay. And then I said, okay, thank you, thank you. I paid using the electronic payment. I waited. I was really excited for the food because uh, I was craving for burgers. It was a sense of normalcy, and I was actually craving for steak because I worked in a steakhouse uh, a year ago, so yeah, yeah, I was craving for steak. But my my budget could only could only afford Burger King, not and not the not the uh, not the hundred dollar steaks <laughs> uh, of Wolfgang. So anyway, so I was waiting. I was really really waiting for for my burger. Um, even if I was studying for the GMAT during that time, all I could think about, think about was um, while, while writing A, B, C, D or thinking about the, I, I would think of, oh, the taste of that burger in my mouth later. Especially I ordered, the, the first one was this cheesy, cheesy mushroom melt and then the next was the, the Whopper. I ordered those, oh my gosh. And then, and then come six o'clock, I didn't receive the burger. 7 o'clock came. I didn't receive the burger. 8 o'clock, I called. I called the lobby. And then I told them, Excuse me, sir. Um, why? I ordered a burger from Burger King a while ago. Um, I haven't received it yet. And then the lobby person told me that, Oh, we, we put upstairs already. You didn't receive it? And then I said, No. Um, and then the lobby person there said, Okay, I'll ask the police. If he actually received a Burger King package, and then, okay. and then that lobby guy asked, and then, uh, and then he told me that yeah, they did receive a Burger King package, and I said what? What? It didn't go to my to, to my room. So put that they put down the phone, and then they investigated. Apparently, it was sent to the wrong room, and then they, the lobby person called that room, and then said. Um, and, and then told, and then the lobby person told me, "Oh, sir, 
I'm sorry, but but we sent it to the wrong room. So the burgers we're craving for you won't able you won't be able to 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 eat them. Um, but there was still the other burger. Do you want that other burger? We could get it and transfer it to your room. And then I said, no thanks, no thanks. That's yeah. another COVID positive patient there. They're, they're giving you okay, no back thanks. to square one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, back to square one. So that was a funny incident. But uh, I think it. it it was a good incident for me because the day after, um, I didn't expect it, but the person who ate the burgers ordered burgers again for me the next morning with the exact orders. And I think the good thing there was that burgers were, were still hot during that time. <laughs> okay. Because I think, I think they were really sorry to the point that uh, they delivered it the moment it was sent to the hotel. Anyway, so, so that's, uh, that's an interesting, interesting story. That I thought it was your cousin who ate it. So it wasn't your cousin. No, who no, no. It, it wasn't uh, my cousin who ate it. And I think, and then when I told that to my parents, my parents told me, oh, that, that was God's way of punishing you because you weren't sharing it with your cousin <laughs> in order for your cousin. <laughs> okay. And so... Anyway, going back. So I went home April 25. Um, I was scared for my life when I was sent home because I was riding an ambulance all the way from hotel, the hotel to the, to, to the house. But my mom requested specifically to not sound the ambulance when you get home. <laughs> but when I got home, the ambulance sounded so she was mad at me instead of welcoming me. Um, so it was... a. Uh, Two days before, my, my cousin already went home. He, he was tested negative already. So that was a joyous moment. They were playing We Are the Champions, the Queen, when, when they went here at home. And um, when, I, when I went home, it was a surreal moment. It was something that, um, it was something that um, I took for granted, but here I am, um, reddishing it. Um, Although right now I take it for granted again, but you know it's a different moment of 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 realizing how important things are to you and how important meeting people in the flesh are to you. Because it was the first time for me to meet people again after twenty five days of just being of seeing virtual people. Um, yeah. So there, there you go. Um, what happened? I took the GMAT come May thirty one. Um, finished all my requirements and and after after being sent home, um, that's when I told the news to everyone. Um, as in, I posted a Facebook post that was public. To everyone, that thank you for praying for me. I was COVID positive for the past something something days, and that's when I knew, I, I it reached nine hundred likes on Facebook for my friends. So. So um, that was when people as were saying, oh, thank God. And then I think it helped me right now to that when people start experiencing symptoms and when they, when they feel alone, they would message me knowing that I had, I had COVID as well. And um, what was my personal experience during that time? Um, and also um, what happened was I... I was eventually accepted to the MBA, um, and yeah, thank you. And then eventually got a scholarship, a huge discount from from the MBA here in the country. And if I were to once again zoom out, macro perspective, what would happen um, for the for AIM, the school that I'm I'll be studying in? They're still waiting it out. Come September, of course, they do have a lot of international Indian students and Philippine students there and some other students from other countries. Um, the status of education would be that um, come September, if we don't, if, if, if the government does not relax, um, we'd go MBA, but virtual. Um, so, um, but still, it's amount because they tell us that 70% um, of their costs go to the people that they need to pay. 30% um, goes to the facilities, etc. And there were 
costs to op- uh, to offset the reduction meaning they had to purchase zoom licenses they had to purchase etc cetera, et cetera. so um that but still the discount for me is a big deal um and being given the the time uh, the, the the opportunity to to live there and in in the dorm there is okay for me as well but um in terms of education because i i work in the education industry of course um i'm a teacher so so i still have connections with teachers in ateneo where i taught from before and there we could get a snippet of snippet of the what's happening so in terms of the public health uh, public education meaning the non-private education the public schools they're going online as well but the problem is the poor people can't really catch up because they, some of them don't have laptops or stable internet connections there was even one news news that came out recently from uh from the from the evening news that there were people who who live in the outskirts of, uh, not the outskirts but in the remote areas of the of the philippines wherein they had to just to attend an online meeting they had to go up the mountain to receive signal on their cell phone and they were camping um for two to three days just to attend those meetings of the department of education so in terms of the private education where i work um it's more blessed um than the you know but um it's it's still a sad reality though in terms of the private education they have adl trainings i don't know what it means um they have they're they're using google classroom right now and they have trainings from from different people who are experienced already with the online education stuff um and they're really really careful to not let students go in even the the default mindset is they will go fully online for the entire year for the next so, school year for the next school year and, and that's what i wanted to clarify because i know again congratulations that you got the scholarship and and they will actually mm-hmm. help you with the room and board yeah the mm-hmm. university so if it's online why do you need to be there or it's going to be um, next? um it's an either or for AIM it's an either or um ah. either on, um fully online but if if the government relaxes come september all the students should be there there's no hybrid education uh, okay. yeah so so but there's there'll be in the same way as malls there'll be social distancing um face shields everywhere mm-hmm. um so so I think that's what they're they're planning for AIM. But for the for the senior high school where I work, the default is fully online. So that once they once once the laws relax, it it would be easy to to just go back to the old olden times. So with yeah. the tra- with the trajectory right now, with uh, because mm-hmm. we were talking about about it from a from a country perspective as well. Mm-hmm. W- where are you guys are at numbers wise is it growing is it declining where 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 is uh, it? ah okay so in terms of numbers wise i watched the news last night and researched for this town hall um the country says that you remember the ecq the enhanced community quarantine yes um that was a strict protocol okay but come may 15th there was a GCQ, General Community Quarantine. I tell you, they're using different adjectives for right. <laughs> many purposes. Different levels um, of play. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, General Community Quarantine. It's a more relaxed, but there's also the moderate General Community Quarantine. That's okay. more That's more relaxed. We're right now, we're right now on... Um, so after the ECQ from May 15 to May 13, that was the MECQ, that was the Moderate Enhanced Community Quarantine. Um, what was different? Um, I really don't know what was different during that time. But um, when when June 1 came, that was the General Community Quarantine. 
you would notice it went back to normal. Um, things can't, went back to normal, but people had masks, people had uh, face shields, there was social distancing, but in terms of traffic, it was still bad. You, uh, I, I noticed that really it's not the public transportation system that's the problem here in the country. It's the availability of private cars by the by the big companies that they sell, the availability of loans. Because um, it, there was traffic. It's as if there was no pandemic that was happening. Um, which explains that right now, um, yesterday, the number of cases, I tell you that April or May, that we were at around 60 per day, a piece of 60 per day. Um, May, the worst was around 90 per day. Um, early June was around the hundreds already. It went to 500s. And then yesterday, it was 1,500 increase yesterday. So, per day. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, right. So, right it's now. It's going up, are, basically. The trajectory yeah, is going really, up. Yeah, it really is going up. And it's very alarming because why are we getting more and more relaxed? And I do think it's because of the, of the pressure of the business sector. And you know, the president, uh, one part of my cast, is, uh, wants to please the business sector as well. Um, and wants to focus on other things. And one of the things like that is the closing down of one of the major news networks that are against him. Um, and and, and uh, then that's, that seems to be the focus of the president right now and not the pandemic, even I think the congressmen. Um, so um, that, uh, that's the problem right now. Um, as the numbers increase, it really... Uh, it really boggles me that with the fact that the numbers are increasing, but why are we getting really more and more relaxed? And restaurants are opening, dine-in is allowed. Um, in church, you're allowed already. Ten people in church, um, and, and, and yeah. So, so that's the situation right now. It the number is increasing, and and when I was really Hearing the news that last night, and the DOH person was, was speaking, they were saying, "There was they were saying, oh, don't worry, there's no second wave. We're fearing of a second wave. We're very fearful of a second wave. Uh, don't worry about that." And then, when we were dining last night here at home, we were laughing because, oh, it's not a second wave. We're really fearful about what's happening right now. Is a, a tsunami. It's yeah. it's a tsunami of cases. That's what hap That's what's happening right now, and it's really bad, it's really bad. Yeah, so I think that's where I end. <laughs> you know, <laughs> <In> my, <laughs> my yeah. that's an hour and forty minutes. That's a lecture already. It, it, it's good because uh, it, you you covered the personal stuff and <clears throat> how the country is approaching it, and then like what you mentioned from a sy sy systemic perspective. I mean, I don't know if we have hotel quarantines here in the U.S. I that I do not mm -hmm. know. So you know what, the, the fact that at least in your area, in your local area, you have that, I don't know yeah. if they're if they're still continuing it or what have you. And then just like what you have mentioned in terms of the haves versus the have-nots, or or people who are who who feel that they're privileged, but that's what COVID nineteen is. It's it's a great equalizer, quote unquote, but at the same time, it really separates the people who have and who don't have. Yeah. Because I, I, with everything that you've mentioned, so it's 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 a challenge indeed, and 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 I think right now what's happening is the way I'm viewing it from from these leaders, from at least from your leaders there and. From what I'm sensing here is that the way I'm interpreting it is that, yeah, let's just whatever with COVID-19. If you get sick, you get sick. If you recover, like you, Teacher Omar, thank goodness. Yes, but, yes. but at the same time, there are people who don't. And okay, then bye-bye. I mean, I, I, it's just that that's what I'm sensing, that we just need to learn how to quote-unquote live with it and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So... I'm not here. We are to left to our own devices. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And I'm not here to identify what's right, what's wrong. Yeah. That's beyond my scope or my 
capability or what this virtual town hall is. But the, the all the things that you have shared, the, these are great. So that way, uh, anybody else who listen to this will have these different perspectives. And but I think there are some universal ones, if you may, again from an from a socioeconomic point of view. One uh, from and then the other thing too that you've identified is it's the process that you go through things. For example, the the Kubler Ross uh, uh, stages of dying or stages of mourning, if you may, of the denial, anger, and then acceptance. And part of the acceptance component is the how you were engaged from a spiritual or religious point of view. And no, we're, we're not promoting one religion over the other here. That's not the point. But the point is, wherever you are receiving your faith or getting your faith, then just continue to have that help you. And then the other thing that you mentioned that I want to highlight is the social support. I mean, when you mentioned that, I, I, I mean, thank you. I, I, I really don't know what I did, but if it helped, it helped. Then, okay, great. Thank you. But, uh, but that's my point as well on my end. Uh, what do you call this? I, I, I do wouldn't know either as well what to say or do, because I know some of the people here as well that have uh, had COVID, and then and, and all I said was just tell me what you need because I I don't want to offer X Y and Z and you don't need it. So there, it seems like your camera's frozen. I don't know if you're still here with us. Am I frozen, Miko? No. Okay. All right. So okay. It seems like you you got cut off, but uh, we'll, we'll. I'm just wrapping up this virtual town hall here. Uh, we'll just wait for a few more here when you when you're able to to come back. But overall, from a virtual town hall point of view, and uh, this is uh, from an international perspective of what's going on there, and. And it's, it seems like here in the U.S. as well is that that's what it is. Uh, Teacher Omar, are you here with us? Hello. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I think it was my internet connection. Yeah, that's fine. You're fine. So I, I was just wrapping up some of the things that you were sharing that I, I'm not going to repeat it anymore if that's okay with you. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, but the bottom line is that there are some universal things that that seems pre prevalent as well, and and uh, that that's what it is. But at the same time, there are some unique things that you have shared, like the hotel thing. So again, I don't know if we have such things here, and even here, I'm I'm, I'm seeing some news reports uh, whether I. You, just like what you said from a critical thinking point of view, whether they're valid or not, they're, that they're throwing these parties on who will get COVID 19 first and stuff like that. So, the bottom line is we, we try to take it seriously. And, and again, it seems like, uh, yeah, we'll, let's just learn how to live with this. And if you go kaput, you go kaput. If you don't, you don't. I don't know. But yeah. at the same time, there are certain things as well wherein uh, when I interviewed one of the medical doctors, and I know this is one of our conversations earlier, is that uh, before this was that, does that mean you will never be positive again with COVID-19? Or is it possible you can get sick again? So is that something that your doctors have talked to you or your uh, family or medical doctors? Um. Well, my my sister, I I talked to her about it, and then she says that um don't uh don't believe the immunity thing. Um, yeah. So so assume that you might be, you might get positive again. That's why you have to be careful. Okay, and that echoes one of the doctors that have identified here because that's what she said. I mean, that's mm -hmm. why we have that flu shot to begin with. <laughs> And even with a flu shot, yeah. the, the efficacy of the flu shot is 60%, 60 to 70%. So you can still get the flu. 
So even, so in yeah. short, if you've already had the flu from before, it's possible that you can get the flu again in, in the future. And, and the, from the way I understand it as well is that this, at least that's a good thing, that this COVID-19 specific strain or virus doesn't, is not, um, is not deviating as much in terms of its uh, yeah. RNA or, yeah, RNA, right? So, anyway. Yeah. Uh, we, we have uh, we do have some pseudo science here at home. Uh, or, or, um, I was trying to make make our experience a bit more scientific, um, or or understanding it in, in a more science way. Even though I'm not really a scientist, um, what I, what I would think, uh, I I was able to hear the news that people with uh, with A blood type they're more susceptible. As compared to people with O blood type, so um, our family, our family is all O. So I that perhaps I'm not I'm not so sure. There needs to be this needs to be peer reviewed. Um, yeah. I think one of the reasons was that we were O. That's why you were saved from this. So I, I think I also forgot that my mother never got results, whether she was positive. Or negative, you know why? Because because the the epidemiology unit lost her smalls. Yeah, and, and I know and that, that what I was sharing with you as well that uh, human error is going to take place. So uh, yeah, whether intentional or not, that that's 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 beyond the scope of the conversation. But there's so many other factors mm-hmm. need to be involved here. So, and uh, and again, um, yeah. Anyway. Um, I, thanks for sharing all of all of these experiences again from from a national perspective all the way to your personal mm-hmm. personal even yeah really personal uh, situation and 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 I think that's the most important aspect that because I'm hearing other people as well is that yeah l- l- might as well get COVID-19 right now and see what happens but that's the thing. It's possible that you can get it again and you don't know what the impact is or would be for you. So we still yeah. need to continue to listen, like what you said, listen to what scientists say when we go out, still wear a uh, mask, uh, mask, you know, at least some eye covering or what have you, a face shield and stuff like that. And, and, and still, you know, just continue with those things and, and about, and it's interesting, with, with all due respect to your mom, who's a medical doctor, well, I, I, I don't know either. But, but in terms of, yeah, inhaling steam, but that, I think the reason why I'm bringing that up is because even for a medical doctor that would go into that route, how much more the people who are denying COVID-19. So it's just... Yeah. Uh, me personally, it's mind-boggling. Why would you deny science? But at the same time, even with the scientific community, uh, let's try whatever <laughs> and see what see yeah. what works. So uh, yeah, it's just uh, uh, but the bottom line, just like what you said, from a critical thinking point of view, and and you can and you can make it work at the same time. That let's let's. Let's listen to what the science says and then yet at the same time have that faith level come into play too. And, yeah. and it, they can both exist in one shape or form. It, it doesn't have to be, I'm just all science and that's it, or I'm just going to believe in faith and that's it. That we, they can work and coincide and, and, and be at peace together to make that happen. So, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so... Yeah, as I was trying to summarize it, and once I'm done with the recording, if you want to listen to what I was sharing, hopefully it's on target. But uh, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll try to summarize it. But uh, but yeah, thank you, Teacher Omar. Miko, thank you for patiently waiting here. Is there any specific question you want to ask Teacher Omar here? Yeah. None? Okay. None. All right. <laughs> so to those who are listening. How about you? Do you have any questions? I'm sorry? You personally do you have any questions no no you, you, you still have any questions? when you were when you were going through your stories uh, you were hitting all the targets that i was uh, trying to go ahead and 
that I was looking for. So I didn't have, that's why okay. I was uh, asking much because uh, you were flowing accordingly. And, uh, and, uh, Something to do with Hamilton, but now it, it skipped my mind. <laughs> Just trying to circle back to that. I no, I it, 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 apparently it's not that important. But the uh, the okay. bottom line is the bottom line is that uh, that you you're here, you're teaching Nico again with keyboard, and. Oh, there's one thing that I know I missed to to share earlier when you were out, and I'll share share it with you right now. Uh, the other important thing too is, is, and this is something we discussed: the importance of routine of of finding a routine, even if it's changed or mm. modified right now. Having that routine is really, really critical for us to continue to feel productive and constructive. And as you mentioned as well earlier, that that I, I'm, I'm glad that, because from my perspective, you teaching Nico uh, the songs and the keyboard, and and I know it's beyond keyboard that you're also sharing with him, but the, the discipline behind it and everything else too, those other intangible components, if you may, uh, that's what I'm going to share to everybody else as well. So try to look into how you can look into find an online tutor, especially right now. It's summer here. And from what yeah. I am hearing as well, the Ivy League schools are going mostly online here. Uh, it's a possibility that most of the education will follow what the Ivy League schools are doing. But then again, states are all states are different and all school mm -hmm. systems are different, so I can't really dictate that or I can't really identify where it's going in that regard. But regardless, if you're a parent, if you are a caregiver or, or whoever that you want to go ahead and learn something new, go ahead and find out how online tutoring can, get, can go ahead and help you out at, at a fraction of the cost. And... And, and that's what it is in this global community of ours that's continued to help each other out. And, and then like what you mentioned, uh, you were taking your home for granted and then you're appreciative again to go and witness that. And then you have shared of people having to climb a mountain just to, just to be there to have it, uh, online connection and stuff like that. So it, 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 it's really sharing all of those disparities and how can we make things as equitable as possible? You know, just trying to go in and make sense of that. But that's a whole different story. And maybe this is something that yeah. I want to share as well, as you mentioned, uh, because right now, uh, I, I know we talked a little bit about it, but with, uh, with the inequities or the problems that's being raised with racism and, and and all of the other isms, if you may, the sexism, ageism, and stuff like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're we're actually we're I'm I'm planning to have more educational se sessions focusing on those components because you touched base on that, and and that's something that I'm going to be working with with a state delegate here. She's a medical doctor as well. And, and this is something that we're conversing if this is something we can do at least once a month just to, just to continuously learn and have an open mind and be more of a critical thinker in, this, uh, in what's happening locally and globally. So there. I, yeah. Anyway, I, again, I, we're super thankful of you sharing all of these personal things. And... Uh, yeah, I, yeah. When, when you mention that, I'm like, okay, <laughs> I, this can go really, really bad or whatever. And and I know I shared this earlier, and I'll share it to you again. And I know I kind of talked to you about this already. I don't mind repeating this, but uh, but yeah. So like what I mentioned, if I I wouldn't know what you need, and I don't want to keep bothering you you know with your situation so the same thing i just ask you hey 
just like what you said, if you need to talk, I'm here. I just don't know how to approach things. The best thing I can do is just listen if, if for whatever it's worth, you know. So, uh, because it's it, everything is so unique. <laughs> yeah. There. I think also what I know what 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 was what is so good in in terms of in terms of resiliency of uh there's another macro insight that I have. Um, people are turning in. Uh, people have been starting their own personal businesses here in in Metro Manila. There has been a huge demand for home-based products. Um, so not just. And and with that came also the demand. I, I'm just reinforcing what you said. There also came for the demand for online teaching. So in the same way that you're you're, you're advertising about online tutoring, um, online. Well, in my own perspective, online tutoring is also partly a lucrative business as well. Because if it weren't for if it if it weren't for this for me finding you and Nico, I wouldn't have started. My own piano lessons here in the Philippines with with people with 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 the previous principal of my senior high school, who is my student right now, um, okay. with some friends from before. So I have around eight students right now, including Nico. So that's that's actually and and if I know other people are doing the same, I have the um, one of the friends of the national artist Ryan Kebia. Um, um, his son is my friend. He's also um, going into online teaching of musical theory and of teaching jazz, piano, and all. So there really is, and entrepreneurship is going up right now in and the country. No doubt, and th- that's the silver lining: is that what what's coming out of this? What are the good things? What are the constructive things? Uh, we're not going to brush under the rug all the negative ones, but at the same time, let's try to focus on the, all the other, all, all of the other positive things that we can um, make out of this. So yeah, you're absolutely correct with everything that you shared. Thank you. So. Yeah. All right. Well, good stuff. <laughs> and again, I'm glad you're here and now you're teaching eight kids and hopefully more. And then <laughs> after a few years, you're going to have those Not three. Kids. Huh? Not just kids, adults. When I say kids, because you're tutoring them, they're kid with what oh, okay, they're okay. learning. Okay, okay. So yeah, from a philosophical <laughs> point okay. of view, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I got you, yeah. Regardless of age for that matter, exactly, yes. But that's the thing. The reason why they're learning from you is they're a kid with that skill level. And now yeah, you're advancing yeah, them true. to more of an adult or independent stage. And uh, yeah, and hopefully you will have those three letters at the end of your name in the next two years. Is in one years? year, just it's just a year. Oh, just a year, and you have your MBA on your uh, after after your last name. Uh, yeah, yeah, MBA All right. after the last name. Hopefully, Super. cross fingers. Yes, crossing fingers, <laughs> no doubt. All right, all right. So good, good, good. Thank you, and regards to your family. All right. And yeah. uh, and we'll, we'll see you around because you'll continue to teach Miko here. And then we'll talk a little bit more once it gets closer to September, okay? Okay. okay. All right. Sounds good. Sure, Thank you again, sure. teacher Romer. Thank you. All right. Take care. Thank you. Bye. We hope you found this video informational and educational. Please share our videos and subscribe to our channel. If not, my dad will not give me dessert.